it's time for two of Nintendo Power. This is Gray Fox 37. And Pikachu 23. And we're going to take a look at it right away. Front cover's looking badass. <laughs> so basically this is the Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest issue, which is yeah. basically kind of the uh, another dark horse of a, of a popular game series. You either love it or you hate it. Personally, I don't mind it. Uh, it does have some annoying... Uh, like annoying things to it which we'll be going over when we get there but uh it's still a great it has a great plot behind it that's for sure so on the front cover basically you've got simon a dude dressed up as simon kind of like looking looking like he's wearing kind of like um roman medieval type of armor and he's got a helmet he's, as he's looking at the viewer and then dracula's body parts are like laid on this on this uh, stone with his cape and then his head's like off glowing his head's off with his eyes glowing red and then there's a skull next to him obviously this is probably very scrutinizing and painful for parents to watch uh, creepy <laughs> excuse me 14 pages of gory details they're also going to do a monster review and fold-out poster of Bionic Commando, more Super Mario 2 from the first issue, and then powerful pointers from programmers and pros. Ooh. <laughs> Nintendo, the source for NES, NES players straight from the pros. So when you open up here, we're taking a look at a calendar of like everything that's going to be happening for the future events, so that's pretty cool there got this tidal wave so you got this kid wearing these the good these are shades that were worn back in the late 80s early 90s they were plastic shades that had like different colored like uh thick you know ear um ear rails and stuff like that this one's yellow backwards hats surfer j uh, jams and a shirt and then like a plastic wristwatch oh and the ear pieces yeah. yeah and he's got like the surfboard with the adventure of link on top there that's mm -hmm. cool so he's got a pile of games on top on the front of the surfboard holding games with right hand and then he's using his left hand to balance as he's writing a pseudo wave <laughs> <laughs> tidal wave you're writing the str biggest fastest most powerful wave in video games powerful titles powerful powerful graphics powerful choices right now you can play over a hundred blockbuster video games on your nes and then video game wave the future is rolling and looking bigger badder and more power packed than ever are you ready for awesome hey i was i loved this i loved this ad so much whenever i'd open up my issues <laughs> i mean it was like i said these were golden times these are golden times and these were just fantastic to just read and look at the artwork and just see what you know secrets that you might not have heard of and give them a try you're like hey i own that game i'm gonna try that out and even if they were just the stupidest things in the world you know when you're a kid you're gonna fucking do them mm -hmm. <laughs> of course so here dear nintendo power player here's your insider's calendar thanks for being one of the first to subscribe to our new magazine hope you enjoy it and keep your scores high and your date straight that's pretty cool sincerely your friends at nintendo i like that so they got a welcome mess message again there and uh it talks about uh howard's birthday super mario birthday things of that nature there and uh, I think that's pretty cool that they yeah. uh, just do that there. So we go to the table of contents. So we're looking at um, Bionic Commando, Shatter the Evil Scientist's Ambitions, Life Force, which is basically Gradius 2, Vic Viper takes off again, which is the name of the uh, craft you fly, and then Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest, get in on all the gory details. Um, then you got very gory. <laughs> <laughs> you got more Mario Brothers 2, <laughs> Renegade, um, RC Pro-Am, which people just really really loved for some reason classified information then a How another howard and nestor comic counselor's corner more stuff from the editor and then golgo 13 which is based off the anime blaster master so we get a uh, look at that game which is a classic of course mm -hmm. and then uh, video shorts for xenophobe <laughs> and uh, uh seer cross they didn't have that terror whatever thing there so i didn't see that noticed um, Mad Max Hudson's Adventure Island is going to be coming in an up an up a uh, upcoming issue. That was another game that um, a uh, old babysitter of mine would bring over, and that was really fun to do there. Then he got uh, you know classics from the arcades like Galaga, Pac Man, Joust, Donkey Kong, stuff like that. So that's pretty cool there. And then you got your top thirty and everything. <clears throat> The top 30 is eventually going to change where they're going to basically show titles that have been in the top 30 for months, like new new ones that enter, things of that nature. So this is you're going to see gradually as we read along how the magazine evolves, and sometimes de-evolves. <laughs> Uh-oh. 
Oh no, nothing with Zelda this time? Uh, that's going to become, the next issue is going to be Zelda 2. Mm -hmm. So, destroy the hidden underground laboratory of the mad scientist. So, by, or I think <laughs> it is. I think it's either issue 3 or 4. I'll, I'll, I'll look later. But, uh, by the commando. So, basically, it's the uh, guy who has uh, an arm, that a bionic arm that can shoot out a grappling hook. In the, um... In the book, in the FX9 book, the Worlds of Power book, basically it could do like, uh, like kind of like a mind control. It could also shoot out like a flaming torch and things of that nature. So, you know, he decided to gust it up a bit. But basically, uh, you would go through this game and, you know, use a, like a gun and then use a grappling hook to go around side-scrolling. And you're just basically trying to find a uh, super weapon and destroy it before it would take over the world. Hey, it's violent technology Batman. <laughs> <laughs> so it shows you how to use the, yeah, right? It shows you how to use the uh, grappling hook in different directions there. And uh, then it shows you how to like swing over and like grab enemies with it and things of that nature. Ooh. So what'll happen is like you basically go to different zones that are on the map that you just travel across this map and they're numbered and whatnot. You'll find like neutral zones where basically you could go through uh, areas and kind of talk to people and stuff. So it's kind of like Zelda 2 towns, so to say, and whatnot. But eventually what happens is that if you fire your weapon in the neutral zone, it immediately turns into a combat zone and uh, you got to fight your way through. So it sounds like a very peaceful game. <laughs> <laughs> So you're trying to save, like, Super Joe, basically, and stop this, like, uh, this ultimate weapon. So it's pretty cool how they show, like, I always love how they draw these maps. Even though I never owned this game, I always loved reading and seeing the maps and just kind of checking out, like, the communications that you have. So you have, like, a communicator where you could talk to people and stuff like that. And in the book, they would give you, like, different colored communicators and things like that, like your allies in the book you would read and stuff. I wonder and, if Artith uh, ever played this game. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I know for sure. In fact, he did. They redid this game on the PS2 as well. Oh, oh yeah. Well, that would be why then. <laughs> so, here they got uh, this rifle kind of looks like a, uh, kind of looks like an L85 in a sense there. I can't tell if it's like bullpup or not, though, because they have the tunnels thing over it. But that kind of has an L85 grip there, so that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he got like, beat the beaches and then deserts and stuff. So this is like an overhead view of this here. So, I mean, this game, this game was, was made by Capcom. So you knew it was going to be, um, you know, a winner because Capcom would typically make a lot of good ones. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there were a lot of all sorts of really nifty weapons in the game. Like they even had like a rocket launcher and stuff like that. Ooh. So, you know, and that was uh, something that was in the, that they were talking about in the book there. <clears throat> So then you got your neutral area here, you know, go find your uh, <coughs> friends and everything like that. <laughs> I love how they have like the Red Cross and then they kind of look like, uh, kind of look like Mexican towns and stuff like that, like Adobe Huts and everything, so it's pretty cool there. It wasn't made by our favorite company, <coughs> OJN, right? Oh, jeez. <laughs> well, this was not never a movie. Uh, <laughs> thankfully not. <laughs> then you got, like, you know, Albatross, that's what we're going to be going through. That's, like, the evil organization in oh, this. Oh, no. And they're showing, like, the final conflicts and everything. So I played I played the, a little bit of this game, and it's pretty fun. I never played, got through it and everything, but uh, I really loved swinging around and things of that nature so now we go to the next page we go to life force and the first thing that draws your attention is this like brain head giga here yes. your standalone your star drive zips your laser zaps while uh, evil zealous makes uh, his plans so these bosses are just really cool you got like um golem which is a uh looks like mother brain from metroid zero mission they got Intruder, which is this little robot that has, like, four swirling things. Intruder! <laughs> <laughs> Cruiser Tetron, which is a uh, fire-breathing dragon. That's probably where they got the idea for the Twin Gorgon for Gra Gradius Three, which was on the Super. And boy, that game was hard but fun. Mm. Then you got the uh, Tutankhamun attack, so it's basically mm. uh, King Tut's, uh, you know, mask. And uh, he's got, like, six gold balls around him. The Heart and Soul of Zelos, which is basically just kind of like a... Uh, dome that has like red in it with like veins that look looks like it looks like and then a red eye i also think that's an oxymoron <sighs> he's supposed to be a villain he has a heart and a soul i'm confused now <laughs> <laughs> oh come on some hearts and souls you, you, belong you know to villains what I too mean. yeah okay <laughs> the, <laughs> nice the little figurative joke. kind yeah. i know i know i'm just teasing there but yeah, in this, I mean, you're basically, the thing that was really interesting about this was you were basically practically flying inside a body, it looked like, so. That's 
cool and creepy. Yeah. And so, slightly gross. Because they had protoplasmic walls and things of that Ew. nature. <clears throat> you know, it's funny because, like, you know, then you, you just, you fly along and the whole time you're just praying Space Girl's got to come out of somewhere. <laughs> that and you're hoping that you're not going to end up with a really awkward magic school bus ending because you're in your body. <laughs> Magic Ooh. school bus. Come on, the magic school mm -hmm. bus. And they got the volcano area here. And, uh, you know, there's the intruder. So, you know, it's pretty It's pretty cool how they... It's just... It's pretty cool. I did. I wasn't really a big fan of this uh, version of the game. But uh, I like the first Gradius and I like the third one. And then the other sequels that came out eventually. I just... I liked those a lot more. This one was a little more ambitious. It, I mean, it had really awesome bosses. But, yeah... Just was a little weird. Castlevania II Simon's Quest. So you get these blood splatters. You get these two bats behind an interestingly drawn uh, Dracula. He's not drawn bad. Just looks interesting. Then you got the badass front cover artwork here with Simon and his whip and his body armor. Aww. And then Dracula looking down at him. <clears throat> no rainbows. <laughs> <laughs> Undaunted by the perils ahead, you steal yourself, S-T-E-E-L, <laughs> for the quest. Are you clever enough to unveil the darkest secrets, strong enough to battle demonic foes in a land primeval? And it's and it's awesome, too, because this game had RPG elements in it. Like, you would attack enough enemies and you could level up your health bar. Uh, you would go, like, from mansion to mansion finding uh, Dracula's, uh, Dracula's body parts or relics, as they're now called. Um, you could get like five different types of whips in the game, uh, each an upgrade upon themselves that do more damage. Uh, there are really cool tools that you could use in the game, like, uh, you know, daggers and uh, like silver and gold. And you could use like holy water, of course, staple there. Too bad they didn't have the cross or ring. I wish they had that. Ooh. And uh, they didn't, though. And then you could, uh, they didn't even have the axe in this game, which was a drag. They just used like the dagger and the holy water. But you could also throw like sacred flame and diamonds around and stuff. So it was pretty nifty. Um, and you could explore like different areas of the Transylvania countryside and whatnot. Each of them had names and there were villages in them where you could get healed by the priest, which was pre pretty much mm -hmm. next to the shopkeepers or the cloaked figures were the only useful people in the entire game. Now, the thing okay. is that a lot mm -hmm. of like uh, marketed uh, strategy guides would basically tell you like, all the townspeople in this game are lying. And the, the sad part about it was they weren't... The dialogue that was translated into the game was poor. So when you would be reading their dialogue, it wasn't that they, I mean, none of them say anything makes sense. I'll meet you at the shore at midnight. If you look into the Death Star, you'll die. <laughs> Things wow. like that. Laurels in your soup enhance potency and everything. And you sit there and it's just like, wait a minute. You, yeah. you, you realize they're trying to say something. Like, you realize that they're trying to say something, but they they aren't it's just so poorly translated you know you'll find the sacred flame under the sixth tree in davos woods and you sit there and say what you know and you, and you look into it and there's nothing there you find it basically behind a stone on a path but ultimately it was just a poor translation these people in the original version and also in the fan remake that i've seen them make they actually do help you they point you in the right direction and give you clues and things like that but in this game they decide to brush off the poor translating by stating everybody in the game is lying to you <laughs> and it's just so funny how they would say that over these marketed strategy guides about this game it just made me laugh so much <laughs> so Everyone in the game is so confused. Like, to <laughs> right, <themselves>. right. <laughs> Those poor NPCs. You yeah. know, you didn't think they had a brain before. You know, now they do definitely don't have a brain because they're <laughs> poorly translated. Yeah. So, the mists of time part, an ancient evil gloom descends, and our hero, the brave and noble Simon, learns of a new and dangerous quest from a gentle princess. You have defeated Dracula, yet you carry his evil curse, she warns Simon. Your only hope is to search out all five parts of Count Dracula, take him to his castle, and burn them. Now, as Simon, you must take up the, the, this quest. As the princess departs in a veil of mist, she offers words of hope. Fear not, brave Simon. If you have the courage to risk your life, you will find the strength to defeat the monster of Castlevania Count Dracula once again. All right, well... Dracula does put a curse on Simon. You have a time limit. That's not something they mentioned in the game, but there's like different. There's actually good endings and bad endings. You have a time limit 
as to how you know how much time you go through the game. So there's like day and night in the game. And what will happen is that if you beat the game quick enough, you'll get the good ending where the curse is lifted. If you beat the game and aren't quick enough, Simon dies from wounds that he sustains. There's also an ending where Simon rises from the grave. What? <laughs> so yeah, uh. so it's it's really cool because this is pretty much the last chapter of Simon Belmont, basically. Now people say, oh wait, there's Castlevania 4. That was just a remake of the first Castlevania game. So this is basically the last quest of Simon, or this is basically the last trial of Simon Belmont here before 3 comes out and Trevor, his uh, father, basically takes over, who was birthed from Alucard and Sonia. I don't care if they, you know, retcon legends. Sonia Belmont is still in my canon. So, you know, screw people who say otherwise. I know Konami retcon it, but fuck it. <laughs> yeah, fuck it makes yeah. sense. It makes sense as to why the B Belmonts going from Simon Ford have supernatural abilities. Mm -hmm. So it just makes perfect sense. <clears throat> so on this page, they'll show a couple of the enemies here. I love how they show the whips. Like you got the leather whip. Uh, you're armed with this on the onset. Then you have the thorn whip, which kind of looks like a tentacle. Buy this powerful weapon as soon as you can. It's really not that powerful. It, it's still. And what's funny is it still looks. It still looks like the leather whip, but it just has thorns on it. Then you get the chain whip, which definitely comes in handy. Wield this for an even stronger attack. The Morning Star, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. This whip has a long reach and a mighty bite. And then you have the Flame Whip, which is uh, mm -hmm. using magic to add flaming power to the Morning Star. And it looks so awesome when you strike it. It basically looks like that flame from Fireman stage in Mega Man. Mm -hmm. And it's like, doo, doo. so it's just so cool how it, how it works there. So I, I love that. In uh, when I did a uh, a World of Darkness RP, I was uh, basically a Belmont, and I, ha I I loved it when I got that power. So. Search by day and to the dark hours of the night as well. That was one of the biggest issues with the game. You could be jumping around and then all of a sudden you pause in midair. You know, what a horrible night to have a curse. Then it goes to the cool, -na 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 -na. you know, it's an awesome song and all. But imagine you jumping across a river platform and then that uh, pauses no. you and it's like, do, do, you know. And then Smash. it's just like the morning sun. And then, of course, you know, great translation. The morning sun sun has vanquished the horrible night. So it's like, all right. So it's cool that they had a day and night shift, which was ambitious for a Nintendo game. It really was. And it was just that the transitions between it sucked. So... So you have, like, uh, Jova, you know, you can go to the Jova Woods, the Belasco Marsh, so they have names for, like, all the areas. You go around the town, get a white crystal, things like that. The crystals would basically show you hidden platforms in the mansions that you could jump on. Also, they would have secrets, like, if you got the red crystal and you kneeled on a cliff, it would take you, basically, through a cliff to a different part of the game. And uh, it's just really cool to have things, <coughs> excuse me, like that to show secrets and everything. So those are a few of the fun little secrets. Then you get, like, the blue crystal and you can go under this river and things of that nature so it's really cool to get progression you know with those types of secrets the mansions were it was nifty because the mansions had the do music so it was pretty cool there unfortunately the mansions would just have like different types of colors behind them but they would all look the same if they redid this game it would be really fun to kind of just you know maybe build these mansions from scratch and kind of look like interiors of uh, of like manor houses and stuff with like different types of perils and whatnot so it'd be really cool if somebody did a re re reboot of this and just made it look really Really cool there so you, see, you have all these mansions or these maps here that show you where to go great strategies uh, from the people you know and what you'd have to do is when you're in the mansion you get you have to purchase an oak stake from a cloaked figure and you'd be thinking oh are we gonna take out vampires no you just use the uh, the stake to basically shatter the orb that uh, the body parts are basically cover or relics I'm sorry are covered in Ew, so that's nice. there were five so there were five uh, basically relics that uh, that Simon would go after. There's the uh, rib, which is which can be used as a shield. There's the heart of Dracula, which you give to get to Rover Mansion, uh, and you show it to the um, to the uh, uh, excuse me ferryman, which is really cool, and he takes you across. There's the um, 
there's basically the uh, the eyeball, which would allow you to like read scriptures as they say in the game and whatnot. But actually, it would allow you to like see some secrets and stuff. The nail, which pre pretty much replaces in some cases the uh, holy water, because with the nail you can attach it to the whip, and then it just basically strikes down bricks and things of that nature. And then there's the ring. Now the ring did, never really had a use, but what I think the ring was was basically the way to open up the path to get to Dracula's castle. So mm -hmm. that's pretty much what a lot of fans have used as speculation. There are only, t aside from Dracula's ghost, there are, there are only two other bosses in the game. In Bram's mansion, there's uh, there's what they call the Grim Reaper, but we know it's Death. So after you beat Death, he'll g he'll give you the Golden Dagger, which is the strongest dagger in the game. There's a silver, a regular one, which is like a short dagger. There's a silver one, and there's a gold one, and they consume hearts. Hearts in the game are basically used as currency, and also are used as you know item power, or, you know item ammunition, basically, just like in the original Castlevania. Mm -hmm. So they serve two purposes in this game, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. You'd also find laurels, which basically were kind of like these cloves that you would uh, eat, and they'd protect you from crossing poison marshes, which of course would slow you down. So these yeah. are basically the roots of like Castle or of uh, Zelda 2 in a sense, you could say. There was also um, Carmilla, who, which it's only her mask, which you can see here in the artwork. And Carmilla basically ga uh, gave up the cross when you had that there. And uh, the cross was basically said to uh, unlock the castle, to, uh, Castlevania, the castle, to, or excuse me, Dracula's castle. That was what you needed to get into it there. So you defeat her mask basically, and then after that, you move on to uh, you move on to Dracula's castle here. So this is a pretty nifty meet, or map that they're showing, and it shows all the towns and everything like that. Now, here's the thing. This is something that uh, was put in here. So basically, after he wait, made it, after Simon made it, the, made it to the castle, and this isn't in the magazine here, but basically what had happened was that um, Simon collected all five parts, and he was unable to find one of the relics, which was the Tooth of Vlad. So what happened was that when he put the five of six in the brazier, what had happened was that um, Dracula's ghost had appeared and started attacking him. And it's pretty, um, it's pretty much an easy fight there, you know, to, to be. Dracula. So it was a very, very, um, how should I say? So it was a very, uh, just anticlimactic battle mm. after everything that you've been through in the game there. So I'm a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to suck your blood. You're a ghost. How? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm going to take your life force. Okay. Well, that's gross. Now go away. <laughs> <laughs> so. Basically, it's just it's just really uh, you know it's just really a uh, just a very anticlimactic battle there. But I mean you know it's whatever basically. So, but uh, you know when you don't but it's like the tooth or fangs of Vlad that you would call it there, and um, you know he never it was just basically a, a a relic that he never knew about there. So I thought that was pretty cool that they had uh, they had done that there. They so basically um, that was really really nifty with that. Now there was also another interesting little uh, there was another interesting little thing that they uh, just mentioned there. Um, one thing that you I would do is I would just use a laurel and basically just whip the hell out of Dracula's ghost over and over and over. <laughs> because that way it made me invulnerable to damage, and it's just like, okay, this is pretty much easy there. Um, there was a, there was like, supposedly there was like a bug in the game where, uh, where you could like drop a clove of garlic and wait until Dracula's ghost dies, but uh, once you would enter, enter like the final chamber, um, you know, at the basement of Dracula's castle, all the garlic supplies would disappear from the inventory, basically. So that's no. uh, that's kind of like a little thing that they had mentioned um, that you theoretically could do. Now I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, if anybody has, uh, if anybody wants to leave in the comments, if they've done it, that'd be cool. <laughs> So that's pretty much it there. So you, then you see this real, the real nifty uh, Bionic Commando poster here. So you've got uh, an M16A1, which was very, you know, very popular. And then he's got his little Bionic uh, 
arm on his left arm there, and then a bandolier of uh, shells. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then there's the albatross's weapons, or super weapons there. So now they continue with Super Mario 2, and the uh, and the artwork got pretty goofy here, basically. So you're looking at this. Have you made through the mischief and, mischief and mayhem of World 2, 3? All right, let's continue. So now mm -hmm. it's showing, like, all of the goofy artwork here. Prince is still looking cute. You know, so mm -hmm. somebody, they got a new uh, artist to design all of this. And then they give you, like, all of the little tips about their jumping abilities and everything like that. So it's really cool that they do that there. And then they show Toad, but, you know, who's pretty much a boss. He's the worst jumper, but he can lift everything and his speed stays the same and his strength stays the same. So mm -hmm. it's like, boom. Um... And then they show you where some warp zones are. So there are some pots in the game to where you basically bring a potion over to it and you drop it onto it and then you go down and it'll warp you ahead. So there were a few of those in the game as well. And I remember discovering that because one day I was just like, oh, you know, there's like a pot over here. I can't go down and hey, I know. Let's see what happens if I bring a potion over there to enter the sub world and go down it. Warp to world four. No fucking way, <laughs> you know, and I would just laugh at that. It's like, all right. So it's pretty cool that they still imp implemented a lot of, uh, you know, classic Mario stuff. Yeah, this is World 3 where you had to ride up the waterfall. I remember this part and hopping on those magic carpets a lot. So. And, uh, you know, they basically have, like, all World 3 was pretty much just kind of like, cool. the castle in World 3 was pretty uh, tough. And then you'd fight Mouser again. <laughs> So that's it. I mean, they just give you, they go up to World 3 and then that's it, you know, and then there's like, you know, 4, 5, 6, and 7 to continue going on to. But that's all they're going to show on that. So now they go on to a Renegade, which is kind of like a Double Dragon knockoff, and it wasn't really that good there. It's not a bad game, but it just didn't, it just wasn't that good. So it's just kind of like a, you know, simple beat em up here. And all they're doing is like showing the fist and then like the chain wrapped around the fist and now meet a really bad dude oh yeah but we don't see the bad dude rc pro-am got the little rc carts there i mean this is apparently a popular game but then again when you read further ahead into uh the top 30 when you see dick tracy actually ends up getting into the top 30 on a part and you sit there it's just like really you really putting mm -hmm. that game in there. But, I mean, it was a racing game. And, I mean, remote control cars were really popular back in the 80s and 90s. And, uh, you know, racing uh, was really popular, like the uh, Indy 500 and NASCAR and things like that. So, it's just something that uh, when you're a kid, it's like, all right, cars driving around. I never really, I mean, I got in, I liked remote controlled cars. They were fun. But I usually ended up getting, like, a lot of really crappy ones. And uh, it was just kind of a drag. I like building model cars and planes, too. So it was great to have that for a bit. But unfortunately, that aesthetic eventually wore out, sadly. Um, I wanted to get a remote control Aston Martin for James Bond. <laughs> that would have been fun. But I never got to do that. So we're going to go to the classified information. So Kid Nicky, Radical Ninja. Now, this great story. I'm glad we have this here. Great story about Kid Nidgey. You remember when I was talking about Lee in the last episode? Lee. My neighbor from Tennessee? Oh, yeah. So, what was really funny was that um, we had a, a Contra cartridge. Now, this is a true story. We had a cartridge that had Contra on it. And we wanted to try out some of the Game Genie codes because we got gotten a Game Genie for Christmas. And we were like, okay, let's do that. All of a sudden, we load the game in it's not Contra. It's Kid Nicky Radical Ninja. And I was mm -hmm. wondering, like, wait a minute, what, did somebody swap the label of these games? Or, you know, <laughs> or was this actually a, um, like, was this like a knockoff? So when you read the, if you read the Game Genie codebook and you go to Kid Nicky Ra Radical Ninja, which we did because we discovered that, I read it and I was like, Wait a minute. This is Kid Nicky. So we went to it and it said, and it actually has a note in the in the code book that says, may not work on some Kid Nicky cartridges. So they oh. must have known at the time that there was like some foul foot to play, you know? So we ended up, I think we ended up getting like a, uh, like some kind of like bullshit copy of it, basically. I want to look that up real quick, actually. And you know, it's so funny. Um... How long has it been? 
2000, I'm trying to think here. It's been like, yeah, it's been like over 30 years, and I never really thought, God, I'm, you know, boy, where does the time go? It's been over 30 years, and I never once thought about looking that up there. So let's see. Let's do Kid Nicky, Radical Ninja, Contra. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. type that in there. Just gonna take a quick look here. Let's try cart. Let's try wrong cart cover. Now yeah. Ah, uh, it's a drag. I guess it's not talking about anything with it there, but I guess we probably ended up getting, like, somebody probably just got, you know, smart and basically pasted over a Contra tag onto it there. I kid you not, it had Contra on it because we were trying to use the Contra game genie codes, and then it's like, Kid Nicky, Radical Ninja, wait, what? <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it was just the darnest thing. So I, that, they don't mention anything like that. But that's when it said, like, it won't work with most cartridges. I'm wondering if it's because they had, like, import carts or something of that nature. But, oh, well. So they got Renegade. So, you know, just some info on that. Then they have some Kid Icarus. Crack the code of the treasure room. So Kid Icarus was a pretty fun uh, point-based uh, side-scrolling game there. So, if you found any extra special techniques, maneuvers, or st strategies that you'd like to share with other Nintendo Power readers, send them to the address on the right. Send your quirks and comments to Nintendo Power at Redmond, Washington. <laughs> so, the Howard and Nestor comic. We see a bunch of people lined up to this uh, home. The amazing Nestor, what's, he's up to, what's he up to now? So, Nestor's dressed up as a wizard. First you do this, and then, and uh, basically he's playing on a controller. Oh, wow, say the kids. So Howard comes in. Hi, Nestor, sounds like you've got your new issue. Isn't that, uh, isn't that tip from page 48? No way, I don't read it. And for my next trick, uh, uh, then rattle, rattle. Uh-oh, where'd my copy go? Here's the new issue. Oh, no. Oh, wow, Rad, let me see. Let me give you a bonus tip. It's Super Mario 2. Carry the magic potion in the place with the most gr uh, grass before you use it. I knew that. And you, you know, pulls up tons of coins and stuff. Can't wait to show you the next issue. Who needs you anyway, Mr... What's it say? Bond? Oh, Bowtie. There we go, Mr. Bowtie. See you in the next issue. Yeah, Howard, always the straight shooting arrow. <laughs> <laughs> so Counselor's Corner has the, this little artwork of a lot of them that are basically up, uh, you know, with like mountains of paperwork on the phone, you know, being all happy, like, hey, how's it going and whatnot. But then you sit back and it's like, are they really happy? Are they really, really happy? <laughs> so... And the first, and it's as devoted to Zelda. In the first quest of Legend of Zelda, where's level seven? You use the flute on the non fairy pole, and it'll freeze it, and you go in. So that's how you get to level seven. That one, that one was a little ingenious, but there was a hint in the game. Eight was extremely tough to find until it's like I'm gonna burn that damn tree down. So. How do I get into level 9? Well, basically, you want to have the, re the fully formed Triforce and use a bomb on the left spectacle rock, so there you go. Second quest, how do I find the letter? And that's a little uh, tougher to find there. And then, where the hell is the raft? It's in the D, motherfucker, D, so yeah. <laughs> Alright, but yeah, second quest, they made a lot of things a lot tougher in it, obviously. Then they have Super Mario Brothers, where all the warp zones, which is really cool. I love getting to those. And uh, then in Metroid, they tell you like how to defeat the uh, mini bosses Ridley and uh, Kraid, so that's pretty cool. And this is what they first looked like, these little dinky things, and now today they're like huge dinosaurs, basically. Yep. And Kid Icarus, where can I find the credit card? And, and then you go into one of the rooms Just there. Just look. Just look, right? <laughs> so now we go to Golgo 13 with that awesome 80s anime artwork style, and he's got an M16 uh, A1 with a uh, with an with a uh, scope on it, a 6x scope on it. Yeah, Golgo 13, the professional Duke Togo. <laughs> so basically, they show all of them. This is pretty good. I tell you, this is pretty cool artwork 
for an NES game. They share like Cherry Grace, Condor, Oz Windham, Maria Lovelet, and then like Red River Jr. and stuff. They're just like painted over basically in different colors, but it's just so cool to see them have these portraits here. New York City, a helicopter transporting a deadly cargo of the uh, of the back and or a bacteriological agent known as Cassandra G suddenly erupts in a fireball near the Statue of Liberty. The CIA blames the incident on a Russian KGB agent whose skill with the M16 rifle, there you go, um, is legendary. His name is Golgo13. But even though an M16 bullet was discovered in a twisted wreckage, not everyone believes Gogo 13 is guilty. An operative from the secret international organization, Fixer, transmits a warning before he, too, mysteriously disappears. Look for the Drek Empire, not Gogo 13. Then in East Berlin, it was great that when this was around the time that the uh, Berlin Wall was up, we had East and West Germany. Uh, but they were going to see the last of their days, obviously, at the end of the 80s there. Um, a man known only as Condor seeks out a fixer and confesses that who he knows is the site of the lethal virus. Golgo's mission is to contract or contact Condor in Berlin, discover the secret leader of Drek, and expose him. Hunted by every agent on either side of the Lion, or Iron Curtain, Golgo sets out a journey few could survive. It's pretty cool. It's a, it's actually not that bad of a game, really. And there's the M16A1 with that old buttstock there. The unadjustable, solid butts, buttstock. So it's pretty nifty just to kind of have, like, inter these cutscene interactions and uh, mazes to go through and, you know, lots of people to kill. Cover your ears. Mm. <laughs> okay. No. Just want to see if you're still paying attention because I saw you nodding off there. I know I'm so boring, aren't I? Very. Pretty much. <clears throat> now we get to Blaster Master. Time to shoot things. So this Relax. is Sophia, the tank Sophia, which is just such a cool design. Jason looks a little fruity there. Mm -hmm. I love how they always have, like, some people, I mean, spiked hair was the, was the in thing back in the late 80s. I, I actually had spiked hair. Rat tails were also basically the in thing as well, but uh, I never grew one of those out. But this is a story about a boy named Jason and his, and his frog Fred. One day, Fred jumped out of his bowl and escaped in the yard. Mm -hmm. Jason ran after him, but was unable to catch Fred before he jumped onto a huge bark box marked Danger Radioactive. Jason mm -hmm. watched in horror as Fred grew bigger and larger until he became a huge monster frog. He then disappeared into the earth. Jason jumped in after him, but Fred was nowhere to be found. Instead, he found an armored vehicle designed to foil the plans of the evil plutonium boss and his band of radioactive mutants. Jason jumped into the cockpit and sped into the ca cavern beyond. Die, plutonium boss! I'll never forget that from the Worlds of Power book. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, this was a really cool game. It, it just, it was a great side-scroller to drive around a tank. Then you would have, like, an overhead shooter, and you could increase your gun attacks and things of that nature. The Blaster Master Zero remake was pretty good, too. And they put, um, they basically put in his uh, female sidekick into it and whatnot, which was in the book there. And uh, you could, like, upgrade Sophia and things of that nature. So that was pretty nifty there. And, uh... Yeah, these are just kind of screenshots of what you could do <clears throat> and uh, overhead and whatnot. It was really fun to play. Mm -hmm. Lots of mazes and upgrades to get to get to different areas. Now they're showing like all the bosses from each stage. That sadly is Fred there in stage seven. Um, there was a toad in four and then uh, you got five, that little crab there and everything. And then that's the plutonium boss and eight. Yeah, way to show what he looks like ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Stages and mutant bosses. Defeat the bosses in the end of each stage to power up for a final encounter with the Plutonium boss. There's one more final confrontation that just, than just being the boss, though. Can you discover what? Yeah, when you beat the Plutonium boss, you're going to see the real boss. <laughs> um, my uh, grandpa on my mom's side really loved this game. Like When we rented it, he loved watching my brother and I take turns playing it. And uh, he really... 
he really got into like a lot of the games that my brother and I are playing. Like I remember uh, when they moved to Arizona, it was great to show uh, Medal of Honor Pacific Assault to Grandpa. Uh, he didn't fight in World War II. My grandpa on my on my dad's side did. <clears throat> my grandpa on my uh, on my mom's side fought in the Korean War. He was a tank commander, and. Uh, I mean, yeah, basically, uh, he really loved watching how video games progressed as uh, time went on, so. <clears throat> so now we go to video shorts, and there's Xenophobe. <laughs> and uh, basically, uh, Xenophobe, so they tell, show you how to pronounce it. Xenophobe. One who fears an anything alien. And it's so funny. It's You're so in the cute little ones. Yeah. And it's so funny because that's where the today's basically term came from. One who fears anything alien, you know, and that's where today's term came from. And not many people know that. They just think it's basically for immigration. It's like, no, sorry, it's not. <laughs> Even though they are. So then I'm like, so you are kid calling them illegal aliens then basically, you know, so that's, uh, that's pretty racist. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, you basically uh, are going through moon bases and they're infested with a bunch of aliens and you're the exterminator, and you have to go through and basically clear them out. Interesting concept, but unfortunately, it just didn't really play out that well. Now, here's uh, uh, Psychross, and uh, it's basically a, kind of like a cycle writing game. It just was really, it looks really awkward, too. I never played this at all here, but uh, it looked really, really awkward. Um, Superman, which... Uh, <laughs> It's not as bad as 64, but yeah, the super the first Superman game to come out was uh, interesting to say the least there. There was a lot of really odd things that you would uh, have to do uh, in order to, um, you know, progress and whatnot. It was just a really awkward game, but you could actually go into a phone booth in it and change into Superman and fly and things of that nature. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom just looks like an Atari game. <laughs> mm -hmm. Lee Trevino's fighting golf, you know. So one of the greatest superstars in the world of sports, Lee Trevino, the one and only Super Max, uh, presents the exciting, lifelike game of the uh, game of the greens. You may choose from any four players as your golfer. Each golfer has his or own her own individual strengths and weaknesses. You also have the choice of any three uh, modes of play: regular stroke play. Nassau gameplay, players operate in a point system, or a tee shot practice mode to practice your favorite most, uh, let's see here, on every, or most ornial hole. Okay, keep your head down, feet together for fighting golf. I guess SNK basically we realized that kids didn't were probably as bored as we were with golf and decided to give it a cool name to see if anybody bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 1943 top-down uh, World War II shooter. Basically, uh, you fly in a plane and you're fighting or you're firing at uh, enemy planes and stuff. So really fun there. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, right, uh, riding one and two, and there's a third yeah. one. Yeah. Jackal uh, was a really interesting game where you basically got to take a co uh, control of a uh, Green Beret Jeep squad. So that was pretty cool there. And you would like drive a Jeep and things like that, and basically uh, get like t weapons to take out. Uh, Gorilla camps and things of the nature, so pretty, pretty interesting game there. Uh, Hudson's Adventure Island, you know, you're trying to rescue your girlfriend from an evil witch doctor, and you're taking Master Higgins uh, across island an island to basically rescue it's uh, rescue her, and you would run across uh, like eggs that would have like uh, hatchets in it to attack enemies, skateboards, fireballs. Uh, you know, you'd be battling all sorts of interesting enemies. You would sh you could shoot different parts of the screen and it would reveal secrets to get to, like, bonus levels. It was a fun game. I mean, it was a very fun game. Uh, they, they did a lot with it later where you could, like, ride animals or use... Uh, they even made, like, an RPG-based one with, like, sword and shield and stuff like that, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, they did that for the TurboGrafx-16, I want to say. But yeah, Master Higgins was awesome. He wore like a caveman outfit and then wore a ba oh, like a white baseball cap. <laughs> and he was a little chubby guy too, so. Magma X I never played, but looking at it, you know, it's like, it looks like an Atari game. <laughs> uh -oh. So now we get to the classics. So they got your Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. classic games there. Uh, Pac-Man, of course, always a classic. Defender 2, which was basically kind of like one of those uh, side-scrolling blaster games there. 
in space, and then uh, you also have Millipede, which is where you'd go around and like shoot, you know, those little things coming at you, kind of like Space Invaders in a sense. Ooh, Space Invaders. Joust, of course, is pretty self-explanatory. Um, Xevious was kind of like a uh, like a top-down shooter, just like uh, Galaga, which was one of the first ones there. And uh, they were like putting them all together, and they were making them for the Nintendo, so they updated them slightly. So I had a, um, uh, a 3D uh, version of Pac-Man. They called Pac-Mania for the computer. It was really fun. <laughs> Pack Watch. A look into the future of NES game packs. Keep your eye on Pack Watch. We'll give you a glimpse of the future with all the hottest news of what's coming next to the NES. Next so. time on the NES. <laughs> <laughs> Link letter. Dear Zelda, I'm here to uh, in, Ki uh, in uh, Kyoto with my programmer, Mr. Miyamoto, and I'm afraid I have some bad news to tell you. Are you sitting down? That's right, you're lying down. <laughs> anyway, they tell me I will not be able to begin my journey until the new year. I had something, um, it has something to do with computer chips or something. I have hoped to spread the hol or spend the holidays together, but I'm sure you could hold on a little longer. I missed you desperately. Yours forever, Link. So yeah, sadly, Link didn't or Link didn't come out until the uh, beginning of the fall of '89, uh, roughly. My creator forgot to write me in with pants. <laughs> <laughs> so next, guess what? Mm -hmm. Guess what's going to be coming or being out on the lookout for the future? Ghostbusters! <laughs> Yay! The crappy, crappy. Oh, God, the really bad one. Crappy, crappy. Oh, God, Ghostbusters is horrible on the Nintendo. Mm -hmm. They need to learn how to spell. I was so grateful when it came out on the on the, uh, on the the PC. That was such oh, a great yeah, game. Really oh, my God, was it amazing. I own it, too. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Paperboy. Extra, extra. The arcade oh, yeah. hit Paperboy Paper is currently Boy. being converted to an NES game. That's okay. I mean, it's not bad, but it's not, you know, good. But, I mean, it's, it's kind of fun to uh, just kind of see what it's like to deliver papers in a fantasy world, ABGN basically. ABGN loves that game. Yeah, I mean, that's the music, basically. Yeah. So... The arcade w version was great because you would actually have like a pedal on the bottom of the machine and then you'd have like little bike handles on it so and a button on like one of the handles to basically toss the paper. Very, very uh, in innovative for, for an 80s arcade game. Mm -hmm. Then Mickey Mouse, which is basically Mickey Mouse Capay. It's not a bad game. It's a side scroller where Mickey and Minnie are going around and battling uh, famous uh, Disney villains, villains while they go through various stages and you have to like collect keys and stuff to unlock uh, doors to get to the bosses and whatnot. Kind of like in, uh, in uh, Little Nemo Dream Master. Oh, yeah. Then Tecmo Bowl, which is the greatest, well, I like Super Bowl more, but Tecmo Bowl started it all. 100-yard touchdown passes, baby. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was such a fun game to play. I remember we used to rent it a lot from Blockbuster, and then my brother and I would just launch launch the balls like why not we'd run back to the end zone and then launch like 100 yards over and over and then you get Tecmo Super Bowl and they got the names of the players and Bo Jackson for the Raiders is just yeah unstoppable. When Blockbuster actually had a store still. Yep oh man those were the good days my brother and I worked on a uh, on a, an allowance system that basically used uh, poker chips and my mom would call them tokens and what would happen is that basically we would do uh, housework chores, things of that nature. If we got five, five tokens, we would basically get uh, get to rent a game from or a movie from Blockbuster, which was sick. Mm -hmm. You get ten tokens. Mom would like cook us, uh, you know. Mom would basically cook us like breakfast for dinner or something of that nature. There, you get like fifteen tokens, and uh, mom would um, basically take us to like an amusement park. You get like uh, 20 tokens, and we would basically do. Uh, oh, what was it? Um, I think it was. I think it was a uh, kind of like a day trip or something like that. And then if we saved up 50 tokens, mom. T 
totally pimped us out like with that we'd have like a pizza party and like a sleepover with friends she would rent like a, a ton of nintendo games for us to like basically rotate through it was so much fun we did that once i told my brother and like what my brother and i did was we were mom never said anything about not combining our tokens mm -hmm. so my brother and i we both had like uh, 25 tokens and i looked at my brother and i said hey man we could combine these and get 50 tokens right now and we could just totally get our friends to come over and tom was like yeah so we came up mm -hmm. with 50 tokens and mom's like you guys are combining like we want to do this and she's like that's really nice of you guys you guys are sharing it and you know learning to you know share and combine stuff so she loved the fact that we did that she's like you're right i never did say that you couldn't do that so mm -hmm. that was really fun mm -hmm. you know, really good to do there WrestleMania, I remember playing uh, that game with my neighbors across the street. We lived on a uh, street that basically had uh, houses that would rotate around a turnaround, and it was basically one of those dead-end streets. Uh, Cricket Glen Cove, I'll never forget that from Memphis. So that was basically uh, where we lived, and uh, right across the little uh, turnabout or turnaround was our friends uh, Matthew and Daniel Melton. I'll never forget their names there. And uh, we would play like wrestling with with them, but there it was pretty cool. Um, Star Trek. That mm. game was sadly a dud, mm. but uh, it was basically uh, working on the uh, '60s show, which was really cool there, mm -hmm. or '70s show. I'm sorry, so it was really cool there. Uh, Racket Attack. Um, never never played or heard of that game, so no comment. <laughs> Track and Field 2 with the, that Nintendo Power Pad, obviously. So we'll get into that on the Ninja Gaiden episode. Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. And here we go. A horrifying double feature from LGN. No! <laughs> no! Yeah. Now, Nightmare on Elm Street was one of the very first game Nintendo games to utilize the four-player the four player control system there. Yeah. So I'll give it that. And uh, if you're really, really, really hell-bent on being frustrated or get laughing or having a good time, mm -hmm. you know, you play that game, basically. And you play it with as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, that's enough on that. Ah, John Elway's quarterback. Mm -hmm. Guy was a great quarterback. Uh, he was sadly on the uh, Stanford team that lost to Cal on that in, in 82, the year I was born. On that uh, amazing, uh, basically that just amazing uh, lateral play. And a lot of Stanford fans to this day still say that the, everything that happened and that was illegal. But that's where it ended with like so many laterals. And then the California player knocked down one of the Stanford band members that stormed on the field because they thought the game was over. And it was just funny seeing Cal running through, a, uh, the Cal player running through a ton of fans just to get the end zone and knock that guy down. <laughs> <laughs> But John Elway's quarterback is probably the worst football game I have ever played in my life. My brother and I uh, actually went down to Blockbuster and demanded, <laughs> mm. <laughs> demanded our fucking money to be refunded to us. Yeah, that's how bad it was. We came in with it and we said, this game sucks. The guy was actually nice enough to actually give us, to actually give our account, like, a refund so we get, or he, he let us, he didn't, like, really refund it. Uh, that's what happened, right? He said, I can't refund. It's like, this game sucks, man. And sucks was becoming a popular, you know, slang at that time. Like, this game really sucks, man. And he was just like, I'll, I'll let you take another game. I gotta scan this win in, but I'll let you take another game. I'm like, okay, that works. So, um, we ended up, uh, oh, what game did we end up renting? Um... You know what? That's actually when we started playing Tecmo Super Bowl. That's what we rented. We rented Tecmo Super Bowl, and our weekend was salvaged. <laughs> that was the first time we had played it, and we were just like, finally a great football game! But it was an overhead football game that, that was kind of similar to the follow behind ISO, or kind of like follow behind angles that a lot of like the modern Madden games have, except just think of it with like 8 bit graphics that barely qualify for. Um, like that barely qualify for uh, Atari games, basically, or that would look like an Atari game. But it was overhead, and you and like throwing a pass was just so ridiculous because you would see it like go, and then like it was incomplete. It would just lay on the ground. And you'd see like this little turd nugget like laying in the middle of the field, and it just it was such a terrible, terrible game. And I felt bad. <laughs> 
<laughs> I felt really, really, really bad that uh, that John Elway's face had to be on the cover of that damn cart. <laughs> oh, what a terrible game. Anticipation. It's an exciting new board game concept for the Nintendo. Connect the dots, yeah, who cares. Bubble Bobble. That's a classic. Tato were the people that created that. The two dinosaurs that go into a labyrinth spitting bubbles out of their mouths and uh, basically capturing monsters in them. What? Oh, oh dear. My brain decided to go to Mars. Sorry. Oh. I caught you. That's why I just I pushed my arms to the sides of me and I'm like, boom, baby. Uh oh. So we just went over Bubble Bobble. And we talked about how crappy John Elway's quarterback is and how bad I feel for John Elway having his face um, on that. I don't remember Bubble Bobble, but I remember the rest. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I had just finished talking Bubble Bobble, so. Oh. That was a fun game, too. Going through a labyrinth and just using bubbles, and then there was a secret ending that you had to get with the, ma or you had to get the magical cane to get to the real path, uh, to get the real ending. Wow. California games, Skate or Die. Yep, those are classics there. You could okay. play a skateboarding game, and then I already mentioned uh, Cast California games. Sesame Street series, so my mm -hmm. brother did do that when he was learning how to read and count and whatnot, so we actually did own a few of those, and they were all right. They made, uh, for the GameCube later, they made a, a um, Muppets board game game, and you had like a bunch of mini games. It was really, really fun. I'll be damned, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, Muppets Party or something, <laughs> I think it was called. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Ooh! That was a tough game. That was a very tough game, but I'll tell you, it was it had its ups and downs, but it was fun. It had uh, you know some like mousers in it. Um, they also had like Bebop and Rocksteady, and it had uh, some really nifty like robots and stuff. Plus, it was featured in uh, the Wizard. So, and uh, we are going to have a uh, a four person uh, special where we are going to have to watch and and uh, you know have com audio commentary on that movie. So, be definitely be on the lookout for that. That's mm -hmm. going to be fun there. Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which oh, no. I'm probably going to end up watching tonight because it's been a while since I've watched oh, that. Movie. That it's is a classic movie, but the game really, really sucked. This sounds too good to be true, but we know that LGN has the rights no! to turn this super hot hit movie into a game. No! And yeah, and every single time that LGN touches a movie game, it sucks. Mm -hmm. This game wasn't even the worst out of them. I mean, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the driving wasn't as bad as Dick Tracy, obviously, but, uh, you know, and the game was like, how should I put this? I'd give it a D minus, basically, because it really wasn't like the worst game in the world. I mean, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure yes. is probably one of the worst oh. end games ever made, but this one at least had some taste to it i'll just kind of say that but it was but i mean it wasn't you know super good and then robocop data east is working on a robocop game and unfortunately both those games not while not really bad they still sucked mm. movie games adaptations like it's kind of sad usually in the past video game adaptations of movies would really suck and then, mm -hmm. basically, uh, movie adaptations of video games would generally suck. The only two video game movies that I really enjoyed were, I mean, well, let's just say that, that were passable and, and enjoyable at the same time, were, super, or not, sorry, not Super Mario Brothers, sorry, Mortal Kombat and Max Ooh. Payne. I really liked Mortal Kombat and Max Payne. Those are yeah. two great video game movies. Hitman, I'm like... Iffy. I'm 50-50. I used to be in a Hitman craze. I used to be one of my favorite video games next to Thief there, but uh, you know, sadly, those progressively, progressively got a lot worse. Then we have, uh, you know, like, but then, like, games that, you know, movie video games that suck, but you just love to watch. Street Fighter. Yeah. Uh, Super Mario Brothers. I mean, they're, they're terrible movies, but I love watching them. They're, I mean, I really, I could, I, I would, could never get sick of those, of those movies. I really, really loved watching those, basically. They're, they were fun and entertainable camp. 
I mean, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna lay it out there. <laughs> then anything by Yule Ball, of course. You, yeah, of course. <laughs> anything by Yule Ball, you basically just throw into the toilet. Mm. So, they have another uh, top ten game prize here, so nothing super special. And then you just kind of fill out everything here, and just go uh, with that there, and you know, kind of go the there. Special is when you be a snowflake. So with this issue, they're up to 109 games now. So, yeah. <laughs> and then there's Howard's Nintendo Power jersey. God, it's so weird just seeing him so young now. <laughs> mm. All right. So the NES Journal introducing the Power Set. So just to let you know, this is how, like, here, this is how the moms and the moms and dads would look. Little sister, the son. You know, you'd basically be doing, like, your track and field. You could even play Mario and Duck Hunt on these. Nintendo has announced the introduction of a new version of the NES appropriately named the Power Set. This powerful combo includes the Power Pad, Control Deck, two controllers, the Zapper, plus three games, and on one triple play pack, Duck Hunt, Super Mario Brothers, and World Crash Class Track Meet. So, yes, I used to, I owned the Power Pack that had the Zapper, and I had Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. I never had the Power Pad, but the Power Pad was basically an, an intricate little twister-looking pad. And it's not, I mean, it's really not a bad it's really not a bad system you know it really got the family involved you could do like track and field and run and you know bounce on it and everything so it wasn't really that bad of an innovation to be honest there so you would stomp on the on the pad left to right and it would make your character run on screen mm. you know so yeah nintendo really was going into the way of the future of hands-free or, or you know hands-free or control-free to enter in you know innovative devices nintendo ds basically was showing that with their little pad especially when they're like here look on uh donna sorrow you can draw the the uh you know the symbols to seal the demon or the uh, boss and everything or you can use it to shatter bricks or things and i was like oh okay so it's really just nifty the paths that they were going to with that then you see this like red Lamborghini in the parking lot. I remember in Texas, I had uh, my math book had a uh, Lamborghini uh, uh, book, book cover on it. Some people would use like uh, paper bags, obviously, to cover books. I my mom would buy my brother and I these just awesome book covers, and I loved like all the vehicles on it and things of that nature there. So good times. <laughs> Nowadays, like, I'm assuming probably, like, elementary school kids are probably using, uh, they might still be using books, but I'm probably assuming that, uh, more than likely they, they're, like, uh, softback covers now instead of, uh, hardback, and I'm also probably, uh, guessing that they're mostly doing things from the computer and things like that now as you get older. It's been, you know... Mm -hmm ages and then i remember you'd have those stamps in the book that would be like uh you know who owned this book before and then you'd write your name on it in the year and how i remember i was using a uh, science book in sixth grade uh back in 1994 i was using a science book that was being used back in the late 80s still <laughs> so it was really amusing to see um you know all those 80s haircuts in those textbooks i'll tell you that mm -hmm. Oh yeah, good times. Meet Chris and Tim Stamper of, uh, what is that there? Leadershire, England. Why? Because these guys have reached the pinnacle of the video game world all, and along the way have created some of the hottest games ever for the NES. The brothers found Rare LTD. Yeah. So these are the people that basically did stuff like Wizards and Warriors and RC Pro-Am Racing. And eventually, Rare would also make Donkey Kong Country. So, yeah, these guys, these are the two guys here, in case you're ever, you know, curious. And there's Wizards and Warriors, which was a pretty cool game. So then they're going over some third-party strategy guides for your favorite games there. And then we've got so the Fall Television Preview, TV 101. Is the story of a young teacher who attempts to create the first high school video newspaper with a group of misfit junior journalists. Oh, yeah. Look at those late 80s haircuts and preppies. Gotta love it. <clears throat> Night Watch is a show which a group of kids form a community watch organization called Knights of the City. The show can be seen Thursdays at 8 o'clock. So, eh, you know, like I said, these were very, these were very innovative ideas for 80s and 90s.
Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't out very long. Leave me alone. <laughs> Dirty Dancing is based on the hit movie, so they were going to do a Death show Dave. with it, too. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And I, I bet you guys are like, I've never heard of these TV shows before. It's because they didn't last that long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one I didn't know was a show. C- celebrity profiles. Eric Dickinson, Ron Morris, and Sean Jones. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, uh, it's a few uh, sports studs. So, they're talking about their little video game experiences. NFL players challenge Tyson for world championship. Mm -hmm. So, basically, they're just, you know, like, I'm going to fight through and uh, get to Mike Tyson and his, in uh, Mike Tyson's punch out. So, now we go to the uh, mailbox. Game ideas. Dear Nintendo, my friends and I have been wondering if we could make a game and send your idea to our company. We're always glad that our video games are stimulating the imaginations of our players. Unfortunately, for various legal reasons, we are not allowed to use your proposals to send them to our product Japan or development people in Japan. You know, and then I kind of look at that and I'm like, AKA, fuck you. You know, you're, you're, it's like, AKA, fuck you. We don't want you to be doing way better than we are. <laughs> That's what I get from that, you know, basically. Yeah. Grandparent power. Dear Nintendo, I think the time has come to confess to all. Uh, to confess all, whoever said Nintendo is for kids, right? But let's not forget my gr- the grandpas and grandmas. My wife and I and uh, my wife and I and Samus are currently blasting uh, Zvite uh, chambers on our way to Mother Brain after a frantic call to your hotline to determine where the ice gun was. <laughs> the ice gun. I uh, see. This this is definite definite grandparent talk. To the ice gun. <laughs> Once we complete this task, we had to wait uh, for Zelda two because the mighty swords have rescued Zelda in both episodes two times. Conquered the mighty forces of uh, Danger Hand in, in, in hand with Kid Icarus both times. And, of course, let's not forget what started it all, the Hammer Brothers. We got them. I must add that all this was done with the help of the Advantage Joystick, except for the Mario Caper. Uh, a must for grandparents. Why beat yourself to death? Turbo them. <laughs> Please tell Mom and Dad about the role-playing series. But don't forget Grandpa and Grandma either. Better hold off on Punch Out for a while. Jim and Jot McGear in Ohio. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, it's like when my grandpa enjoyed watching my brother and I play, you know, Nintendo games. So, Alter Ego. I noticed that Howard Phillips looks a lot like Little Mac on Mike Tyson's Punch Out. Is this a coincidence, or is Little Mac made to look like him? It was not a preconceived notion to make Little Mac look just like Howard. It might be one of those amazing coincidences. And it slightly is, because Little Mac does kind of look like a younger Howard Phillips. <laughs> so, basically, they, uh, they there's a few others there. Punch-Out Poem. I don't want to really read that, so forget that. Pretty powerful poem, Paul. <laughs> so if you want to read it or rewind it or pause here, just, yeah, there you go. NES Achievers. So they got... Uh, all these uh, people, and they finally decided in this episode to show it because probably people wrote it and be like, "Hey, chuckleheads, how the hell do you actually take a picture of you of your uh, high score on the TV? Our flash keeps going off on the screen." Hello. <laughs> Wasn't that long? Leave me alone. Was that like less than a minute? Leave me alone. <laughs> Video Spotlight, Power Players. So basically, again, this is where you get to basically, you know, talk about how cool you are and everything. So we 999 jump... million points. Right. <laughs> Power Player Profile, Pete the Natural Brin, City, Windsor, Connecticut, age 17. Favorite game? I think Mike Tyson's Punch Out is the most fun to play. I like to uh, I like to beat the, all the boxers, uh, but Mike Tyson is a real challenge. Outlasting or outstanding video accomplishment. I think it was probably most. I was probably most proud when I beat Mike Tyson in just uh, four hours of gameplay. <laughs> and then today we see people going through the game in like what, like twenty minutes. You know. Yeah. And the reason I could do it quickly is before I ever played the game. I watched a friend play. This gave me a good idea of what I was going against. I beat most of the guys after a couple tries, and then I beat Tyson in maybe twenty tries. The trick is to dodge quickly with a light touch and then hit him with at least two punches. 
special strategies, it's pure determination combined with know-how. Uh, since I'm a great computer programmer, I have, um, I have to know how to fool them. And he's 17, and this is what a 17-year-old looked like back in the 80s, compared to what 17-year-olds look like today, faggots. <laughs> wow. I'm just going to be blunt, sorry. I know, right? <laughs> Other interests. I golf, in the, I golf in the summer and play football in the fall, which with my friends. I also like to program my computer. My friends and I made a game uh, with, uh, with just joust with kangaroos instead of birds. Uh, future Nintendo games. I'm definitely going to get Double Dragon, Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, and Ice Hockey. Mm. Top 30. Legend of Zelda still type. They're topping it. So number 2, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Number 3, Metroid. Number 4, and that's good. Metroid deserves to be in the top 10. Yeah. Number 4, Super Mario Brothers. Number 5, Kid Icarus. Number 6, Double Dragon. 7's Ice Hockey. 8's RC Pro-Am. 9 is Rad Racer with the Power Glove. It's so bad. <laughs> Number 10 is RBI Baseball, which I'm surprised it's even in the top mm -hmm. 10. It's fun, but I don't think it's top 10 worthy. 11 is Contra, which should be in the top 10. 12 is Castlevania, which should also be in the top 10. 13 is Goonies 2. 14 mm -hmm. is Mega Man, which should be in the top 10. Um, 15 is Pro Wrestling. 16 is Double Dribble. 17 is Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. So that's going to obviously skyrocket eventually. 18's Top Gun, I don't know why. 19's Rambo, I don't know why. 20's Renegade, 21's Wizards and Warriors. 22's Akari Warriors, I don't know why. 23's Baseball, 24's Rygar, 25 is Excite Bike. 26 is Kung Fu, 27 is Kid Nicky, 28 is Super Mario 2, 29 is Xanic, and 30 is Pinball. So. Basically, there weren't really a lot of super hot games out at the time, but they're coming. You're going to see this uh, top 30 change like big time in the next couple of issues. Players' picks have number one at Legend of Zelda. Um, you know, but uh, basically Zelda, or, you know, uh, Zelda 2 Adventure of Link's going to close in, obviously. Pros' picks have Legend of Zelda number one, which is no surprise. I mean, it's great to see these in the top three here, like Metroid and Mega Man, uh, or not Mega Man, uh, Mike Tyson's Punch Out. And the dealers pick RBI Baseball. I sit there and I guess the dealers just really, really enjoy playing baseball a lot. So, And last but not least, next issue. Track and Field 2 we'll get a look at. Blaster Master we're also going to get a look at. So yeah, I remember Zelda 2 is going to be for the fourth issue. And then a giant holiday giveaway. We're amassing gifts from all over the globe to make hundreds of players' holidays really happy. Be sure to enter the November-December Players' Poll Contest. Plus, don't miss the latest tips in the Counselor's Corner and Classified Info. Get some holiday gift ideas from Nintendo Gift Guide and start getting ready for the New Year with Pack Watch. So, it's pretty cool. Howard Phillips leaves... Uh, we've learned a lot about our magazine publishing business while making the first two issues of Nintendo Power. It could be a lot of hard work, but also a lot of fun. We had to chase down pro football players en route to training camp and track down the package with photos of the Lamborghini, or track down the package with photos of the Lamborghini, hoping they'd arrive from England in time. We spent a week in 110 degree weather in, the very t uh, in a very small town in the middle of California for a printing press check and then learned, had the satisfaction of carrying the first finished copies back to Nintendo. We have celebrated uh, with, the, with the Pacific Northwest Salmon, Bar Salmon Barbecue. We've got, to, we've, excuse me, we've got into some scraps of whether the game tips are all presented correctly. We think they are now, and we're going over to pay to $200 taxi cab fare on one of our trips. Ouch, I, I lost. One night we stayed up till 4 a.m. working on Pack Watch Copy. The next morning, though, we, needed, we took a much needed break and went to Disneyland. It could be a little, it could be a, a big hectic racking up hundreds of thousands of miles traveling the world trying to put together a world class magazine, but it's all worthwhile when you see the results and hear from the hundreds of thousands of NES fans like you who believe the power in the power, Nintendo Power. So you see, this is such a great editor. I mean, this is probably, this is a dream job, going around the world to, to write this magazine, just a, 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 or even just the country. It's just such a dream job. Mm -hmm. 
you know, going around the country, caring about your fans, being able to drive and fly around to get interview people. It's great. Mm -hmm. So that's it for the second issue there. And it was, you know, a whole lot of fun to relive some uh, fables of my time. I'll have more fables, obviously, mm -hmm. as we go. And uh, it was just wonderful to do this. So next time uh, we'll be looking at the Blaster Master issue, and then after that will be uh, Zelda 2, and then uh, f further beyond that will be Ninja Gaiden, the first Yay. Ninja Gaiden. So we'll start to see some really, really good games coming up. Mm -hmm. The Super Nintendo is going to be 20 something, uh, 20, 20 to 30 ish something issues away, but uh, basically this is where the route started. It was great to do that, and this is still one of the most badass covers of Nintendo Power to this date. Well, and I don't want to say to this date because obviously they're still uh, doing things with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or not doing anything with it, so. But uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun to go through that. Uh, let's see. Pikachu is down for the count. No! This <laughs> is. Uh, you are dreaming! <laughs> yeah, we were going to do a uh, Sub Zero ladder with Pikachu, but she's too tired. No. <laughs> no? No. But you were being so rude and falling asleep several times. That's rude. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I'm going to have to be rude in turn. Sorry, you can't do the, the Sub-Zero ladder. I'm going to have to go cry now. And cry again. Yes, again. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I guess I guess we'll do it. You know, otherwise, yeah. uh, otherwise Pikachu's going to strangle me. Again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really funny. We're doing uh, we're doing web based training basically with uh, with uh, video cameras, and I really really loved how uh, Pikachu ba basically uh, got her Pikachu hat on, and uh, we went on camera, and I was just like, "Hey, want to see me try to capture a, a Pikachu?" And I held one of my Pokeballs up, and all of a sudden she came on camera and started strangling me, and everybody got a big laugh out of it. Yeah. There, and she finally got to meet uh, every or just about everybody on the team there, so that was pretty fun. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, it was great to look down Nostalgic Rogue. We'll probably do issue three more than likely this weekend. Uh, well, I'm not sure what time, but we'll just call it quits here. And uh, this is uh, Gray Fox 37. Pikachu 23. And we'll see you on the Mortal Kombat trail.